last couple of weeks I've had on my mind uh, different covenants that the Lord made. And I, I'd like to talk a little bit this morning about some of that. I want to start off in the second Samuel in the 23rd chapter. And I think I'll start in the first verse because it's talking about David. You know, David uh, was a, a man of God. He actually was a shadow of Christ. And he didn't always do those things that were good. He was like any other man that lives on this earth. And But he loved the Lord and he uh, gave him all the honor and glory. But in this uh, 23rd chapter, in the first verse, now, be, now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel, said, and this is him, David, talking about what the Lord said unto him. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. Now, when David said this, that the Lord's the Lord was in his tongue, he spake with him in his tongue. He gave David the ability to be able to speak these things that were from God, and those things that would be true and and uh, uh, things that we can live by, okay? Things that we can, can uh, build on. And he said, the God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spake to me. Now, the God of Israel said, this is God talking, saying that the rock of Israel spake to me. And I take that to mean that Jesus uh, spoke to uh, the Father. And that's what this is saying, that he spake to me. He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. You know, those, there's a lot of men that in this world that rule over uh, different people. And a lot of those uh, men are honest, are good men. But there are some of those that aren't. But here, uh, God is, is, is saying that Jesus spoke to him and, and telling him that they must be just, that they must rule in the fear of God. They, be, they must reverence God. They must give him all the credit and honor and glory for what he has done to be in the fear of him. And he shall be as the light of the morning. You know, when the sun first starts coming up in the morning, it slowly does away with the, with the, the darkness. But before it ever comes up, we can see and once it gets coming up above that horizon, we can see as plain as day. So that he shall be as the light of the morning, the morning in the east, the sun coming up in the morning. How beautiful that is to see in the clouds when the sun comes up and see that. That God has made that for us to look at. Something that is great and marvelous. And we take it for granted every day that it happens. But if not for the grace of God, uh, we wouldn't be able to see that. And it's beautiful. When the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. You know, after a rain in the, in the morning, early morning or in the, at night, it leaves moisture all over everything. 
And when that sun comes up in the morning and you look out across the field that's got, is wet and has that dew on it, that's a glorious and beautiful sight to see, to see that. That is something that, to me, uh, is the epitome of God. It's, it's what he has done that, that allows us to see his power and, and his uh, purpose in life. You know, uh, that tender grass coming up out of that dirt has really nothing to depend on except God of bringing it up. If, it, if he had not created it, it would never have come up. But it's something that God made, and you can almost see it growing when it comes up out of those seeds. Although my house be not so with God, yet hath he made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things, and sure, for this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to grow. This to me is uh, David writing this uh, as he was uh, moved by the Spirit of God. And God was telling him that he hath made an everlasting covenant with us. He hath uh, given us uh, that hope that we have something better than this. That we have a life uh, in Him. That He gives us through His Spirit. He gives us that life and He has made that covenant with each and every one of us. He made that covenant in eternity uh, before He ever laid this foundation of this world. He made that covenant because He chose His children. And he decided that he was going to uh, keep us and bring us to him at the end of time. He made that covenant before time ever began. You know, uh, that's something miraculous in itself uh, when we think about it. Uh, that God in heaven uh, purposed uh, what he had done. He purposed that he would be with us, uh, that he would give us his spirit, that he, we would lift us up, uh, that he would bring us out of the dirt and the mud, uh, that he would make us walk upright, uh, that he would give us a conscience, uh, that he would give us something that would we would know uh, what we did wrong, and we would do, try to do better. And that's something that we all try to do. We all try to do better. And it's because that he is in us. If he was not in us, uh, uh, we wouldn't try to do anything better because it would all be all about us. We would be totally self-centered. And some people are that way in this life, you know. You know, uh, there are some people that do all the things that God uh, has asked us and commanded us to do. I won't say all. Take, take back that all. They will do a lot of the things that God has commanded us to do. You know, Israel, when they were in, in, uh, in the desert, after they had been brought out of Egypt, and they went across that Red Sea, they wandered about in the desert for 40 years. Uh, they wandered there because they would quickly forget the things that God had done for them. And they would st start thinking about themselves and worrying about what they were going to do or what they thought they needed to do. And that's the same thing that we do. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, those that do that all the time, that wander and, and think, well, I, it's all about me, even though they're a child of God, uh, their uh, faith is not going to grow. Uh, that's what he means here. Uh, those that uh, are, do not follow him, uh, that do not uh, believe that what he has done for us is true, uh, those that will not grow. You know, uh, uh, the ones that do believe it uh, have a little bit of, of, of growth in that faith that he has given to us. Uh, we're able to uh, come unto him uh, and bend down on our knees and ask him favors. 
and thank Him for the things that we've done. And when we come and worship Him, uh, we're able to uh, uh, glean a little bit uh, from the sheaves. We're able to uh, get a little here and a little bit there. We're able to uh, gather that, and it helps us to grow spiritually. It helps us to become a better child of God. You know, there, there are a lot of his children that don't know the things that we know. They don't know the truth. And those are the ones that have the most trouble in this life. They go about thinking that it's all about them, but, but they love the Lord, but they're so concerned with material things and things that they need that they don't always get that blessing that they can get. And I believe that's what David was talking about here. Over in the, uh, I believe it's the 89th, I've got it written down here, but I can't see it. Uh, 89th chapter of Psalms. I want to look at that for a second. 89th chapter in the 26th verse. <clears throat> he shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. You know, uh, our eternal salvation uh, depends on something. It depends on a, a foundation that was laid uh, when God made his covenant with himself. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He laid that foundation. And if Jesus Christ is the rock or that foundation that we are building upon. Uh, he shall cry to me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. That's the foundation of all of our salvation, whether it be uh, for eternity after the world is over, or whether it be in this life. He is that rock. He is that foundation of that salvation that we have. There, you know that there's many types of salvation that's in the Bible. It's not every time it talks about salvation does it mean eternally. It probably means that many fewer times than it does when it's talking about temporal, here and now. You know, they were the disciples were in the ship on the sea. And the, there was a tempest, and the waves were crashing and everything, and they thought they were going to die. And there comes Jesus walking toward them on the water. And Peter, after he recognized who he was, asked if he could come to him. And Jesus said, you know, come on. And Peter started walking on the water. But his faith was weak in that he thought about, well, how am I walking on this water? I'm going to drown. And he started sinking. And he said, Lord, save me or I perish. And Christ saved him there at that time. To me, that, that, that's a, a type of the church uh, where we come and, and we uh, go about our week and we do things that uh, uh, are maybe not always pleasing unto him. We don't always think about him. We forget about him and we go on about our business. But when we come here uh, to church, uh, we express a little bit of that spirit that's in us. We're able to express it in a way that shows love one to another. We have fellowship one with another. And we come seeking his face. We come wanting to see uh, Jesus. And Jesus lifted him up out of that water. And he saved him. And he does that with the church. Uh, when the church comes to him and said, Lord, save me or I perish, he will lift us up. 
He will save us for right now, here and now. He does that. And that's what most of the words in here uh, that refer to salvation are talking about. It's a timely type of salvation. Man wants to put an eternal aspect to it. Too many times. We'll go on a little bit. Also, I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. The covenant that we talked about a little bit ago, that covenant that was an eternal covenant that was made between God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, that's that covenant we're talking about here. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore. God is speaking about his son, uh, Jesus Christ, who he sent to be down here on this earth. His seed also will I make to endure forever. Christ's seed is that Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit that comes into our hearts uh, it takes that old stony heart that we have in our chest uh, and it, he takes it out and he gives us uh, this a uh, new heart, uh, a fleshy heart, a heart that uh, can be touched, uh, that can be pricked, uh, that can be, uh, uh, is flesh, it lives, uh, but it lives because it has his spirit in it. He takes out that heart, he gives us a new heart. And it, at that point, we're his seed, and we're going to live forevermore. And his throne as the days of heaven. You know, I believe that uh, in heaven, there is no time. But this mentions here as the days of heaven. It's an eternity. Heaven is an eternity to us once we get there. Right now we're living, we can't even imagine what eternity even means. It's, there's no way that we can understand what that means. Everything that we do is based on time and days and years. That will all go away once we, he comes back and grabs us. If my children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, that's something that we do every day. That's something that the children of Israel did every day. And those children are a shadow of all of his children. That was that the people, that was his people that he chose was Israel in the book. But it actually refers to all of his children that will have that he has all of them in an innumerable number. Then, if they, let me read that last one, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. He's going to give us a whipping. He's going to prod us in the right direction. He's going to Give us strife for those things that we have done that are against him and against each other. Nevertheless, even though we do these things, uh, there's something else that we have to look forward to. Nevertheless, we've done all these things. We've been bad. We've done things that uh, we don't even want to talk about. We've done things that we would never tell anyone. We've done things that are bad, but God knows every single one of them that we've done, and he will give us a strife. He will prod us with that rod uh, to get us to straighten up. He did the same thing with Israel. But we are have a fleshly body. We have that flesh that's in us. And we are going to tend to not want to do something that somebody tells us. And that includes God. It's that flesh. That flesh is enmity against God. It is an enemy of God. And that is why we can't do everything always right. Everything always good. 
is because of that flesh. But he's nevertheless, even because of that, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. God uh, is not like us. You know, the book tells us that. That his thoughts and his ways are higher than our ways. And that when he makes a covenant, he makes it to, uh, to be forever. And this covenant, I think, uh, is an eternal covenant. It was a covenant that was made uh, before time began. It was made in eternity. And it will live throughout all eternity. It transcends time. Time is nothing. That covenant will always be there. I want to go over to Psalms uh, 111. Here I'm not seeing straight. Uh, you know, uh, David, like I said, was, was a man of God. And he was a shadow of Christ. But here in the Psalms 111, he talks a little bit more about uh, that covenant. I want to start in the seventh verse. The works of his hands are verity and judgment. God's works or the things that he does are verity. That means that what he wills will happen. It's very sure. It absolutely will be. And judgment. He has given his son uh, to us to die for us, to hang on the cross for us. And he judges us daily for the things that we do. He judges the wicked in the last day. He will judge them. All his commandments are sure. Everything that God wills is going to happen. His commandments are sure. There's nothing we can do about it. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. He sent redemption unto his people. That redemption uh, was part of that covenant. That redemption was uh, his son uh, who came and lived and walked on this earth uh, as a man. He was born of the Virgin Mary and he went through uh, the very same things that we do. He grew up as a baby. He was a little child. He was a teenager. But the whole time, he was God. He was the Son of God in that he was going through the things that we do. He had to come and live in the flesh so that when he died for us as a perfect man that had no sin, that that was the only way that we could be found righteous is through his life, his blood. He redeemed us. Or he paid the price for us. That's redemption. He sent redemption unto his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Those people that he chose uh, uh, will live forever. Holy and reverend is his name. That's God they're talking about. Uh, God is reverend. Uh, he is uh, greatly to be praised. He is the only one uh, that, uh, that we should look to, to for our daily bread. He's the only one that we should look to for help. We need to cry out the Father and call on his name when we need something. He can give us 
all things. All we have to do is ask. And we sometimes ask amiss. We ask for the wrong thing. It is that flesh that's in us that causes that. But sometimes we ask for the right thing and he will give it to us. He's, he's, he's uh, very merciful toward his children. You know, I want to go over to Jeremiah real quick to the 31st uh, chapter. And I want to go into the 31st verse, 31, 31 in Jeremiah. <coughs> Behold, or wake up and listen. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord. That means it's going to happen. The day's coming. That I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. A new covenant. That's not saying that he's done away with that covenant that he had made in eternity before. Because that new covenant that he's talking about is a covenant with the people. A covenant that he is going to give them something new. Now when he was had the children of Israel at the beginning and those Israelites, he gave the law to Moses. He gave his law to them. And they were to live by that law. And that was that first covenant, or the old covenant that we were talking about here. That was an old covenant. That's not the eternal covenant that we're talking about. But he gave them that law that they should live by. Or a covenant. A covenant is something that if you do this, then you're going to get that. Or if I do this, then you're going to get that. That's sort of what that means. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, Israel break that broke that first covenant. <clears throat> Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. He gave them everything they needed uh, to live. When they were wandering around in that desert, they had no food and water. But he gave it to them. Moses tapped his rod on the rock and what came out? Water. Jesus Christ came out through that water. It was him that they drank at that water. Jesus was there. Jesus made that happen. And he gave them water. He gave them manna from the sky that fell for them to eat. They didn't necessarily like, like it. After 40 years, I think it probably got pretty old eating the same thing all the time. And at the end, they didn't want to eat any more of it. But it was all they needed to live. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, after the old covenant, I will put my law in their inward parts, and I will write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. He has written that law in our hearts uh, when he placed us that fleshy heart inside of us. When he pulled out that old stony heart, uh, that heart that he put in us, had his laws written in them. They were written in the inward parts. Each and every one of his children gets that heart. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me. All of his children shall know me. Every single one will know him. 
that doesn't mean that they're going to do the right thing. It doesn't mean that they're going to follow him. Jesus, while he was here, uh, was asking, take up your cross and follow me. He wasn't making them do it. It was only the ones that wanted to that went. And that's the same thing it is here. For they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sin no more. He has forgotten our sin because he's able to uh, uh, see things that we can't see. He saw that when Jesus died on the cross that he gave his life for us, that he spilled his blood, that he was wounded for our transgressions. He saw that and he forgave us of everything that we've done. Not from that point forward only, but from that point backward for all his children that have ever lived in this earth. He did that for us. I want to, I want to go over to real, just over to the 32nd chapter real quick. You know, uh, after a time, God <coughs> scattered uh, the children in, in Israel. And they were sent out over all different countries. And in the 32nd chapter, the 37th verse, he says again, Behold, I will gather them, or his children, out of all countries, whether I have driven them in mine anger. And I will bring them again into this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely. I will bring them again to this place. You know, every one of his children that he puts his heart, our, our, a new heart into us, makes us a new children, at that point, I believe that we're in a place. We're in a place of grace. And that one day he's going to gather us all together. He's going to bring us all together unto one place. And that we'll all be there. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart. One heart in that we've all got the same heart. That we've all got that spirit. That spirit of God that's in us. That we've all got the same heart. That we've all got the same laws that we know. We've all got the same love for one another. That we can know the things of God because of that heart that he's put in us. And one way. And they may fear me forever. Or give him reverence forever. For the good of them and of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. You know, we can go about our own business and wander around doing all kinds of bad things and never have a thought about God in our, in our minds. But we can still be a child of God. Just think about the cross. There were three men on that cross, or on crosses. Two of them were actually criminals. And the thief that was next to him undoubtedly had done a lot of bad things in his life. And he thought that he deserved to hang there because he got on to the other one for railing at him. But they were both railing at him at the beginning. And his heart was changed. God changed his heart in the last moments of his life and gave him a new heart. And he was able to see. He was able to know the things uh, that we know. The things that he 
gives them to us that we might understand him a little bit better. I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. No matter how bad we get, no matter of the things that we do, he knows where we're at. He knows the things that we've done and that we're not able to get away from him. We're not able to hide from him. Jesus said he put us as sheep, that we were lost out on the hills, and that he was going to find his sheep. And he's found us. He found, finds every single one of us. He doesn't lose a single one. You know, over in the, I want to go over to Hebrews real fast. In the, in the ninth chapter, well, let's see. Let's go with the eighth chapter. Paul talks a little bit about this covenant. And he talks about how uh, the covenant that he was making with the house of Israel after those days. But in the twelfth chapter, twelfth verse of the eighth chapter. He says, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now, at this point that this was written, Christ had not died physically for us. But remember we talked about eternity a little bit ago. Eternity, something that we can't understand. But Christ, when he was died on that cross, he was as a lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. It was something that was going to happen that could not not happen so that God was able to forgive those Israelites that were his of their sins and iniquities, even though Christ had not died on the cross as yet. In that he saith, a new covenant he hath made the first old. He made that new covenant, and the law service then was the old covenant. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. But you know that new covenant that he made was made because Christ was going to die for us. It was as if it had already happened unto God. And over in that 11th verse, that same of the 9th chapter, sorry, the 11th verse of the 9th chapter of Hebrews, <clears throat> but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is to say not of this building not of this body neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood or the blood of Christ he entered one time into that holy place which was part of that old law service. The priest uh, had to enter into that holy place uh, to give up an offering for the sin of the people. And Christ did that one time. Having obtained eternal redemption for us, that one time that he went to that holy place, that one time that Christ died on the cross, he paid for all of our sins. The old law service had sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, and not one time did it pay for any of our sins. It was as a shadow of things to come. It was as a shadow of Christ, that Christ was going to die for us, and it was because of that covenant that he made with God in the beginning. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes 
of the heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, or that part of us that is enmity toward God, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, able to purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. That means he is the leader or the one that feeds us uh, the things that we need to know about that, the new, new things that happened because of what he did. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. All of us that are called, all of those that God gives us that new heart, that he is calling us at that moment. He is calling us and letting us know that we're his. We can either accept that call or not accept that call. You know, there's a lot of denominations that talk about accepting Christ for eternal life. But we are going to live no matter what because of his blood that he spilt and that new heart that he gave us. No matter whether we live to him or whether we live to ourselves, we're still going to live with him in glory forever. You know, over, I want to go back over to John real quick. Or to John real quick. In the fifth chapter of John. In the 25th. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead, the dead, those that are not living spiritually. We may be living in a physical sense, which we are, or we are living in a physical sense, but we're dead spiritually until he calls. When the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Those that have that heart that he's put into us can now hear him. We hear his call, and we know that something's happened to us. Most of us are going to feel the same way. We're going to feel that we're the worst person, the worst thing that ever happened on the face of the earth that there could be nobody that thinks the things that I do or that has done the things that I've done. He's given us that conscience. He's given us his spirit that causes us to live. We have, at that point, become a new creature. We're a new man. The old one is, is gone. We'll never be back to what we were. We're now new. He's given us his spirit. He's given us life eternal that will never end. We'll always have it. I'm going to go back to Hebrews again, over to the 10th chapter. Or I'm sorry, it's the 11th. No, it's the 10th chapter. I just can't say. 10th chapter of the 35th verse. And then I'll close after this. <clears throat> My voice is almost gone. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence which hath great recompense of reward. Cast not away your conscience. That means don't throw your conscience away. Listen to what your conscience tells you. Because in that, you've got a great recompense of reward. That means you're going to receive something uh, if you follow and listen to that conscience. For ye have need of patience that after you've done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. The promise that he will be with us. The promise that he'll never forsake us. He'll never leave us. That's his promise that we will live forever. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come 
and he will not tarry. He will come and take us home to be with him one day. And I pray for that day. I thank you all very much.